nice to be here. Um, I think this is a safe distance, I think. If you don't mind. Um, I'm really happy to be doing, well, happy is just a hard thing. There's nothing happy about this piece at all. Um, but um, I'm Brian Gilliam, and I am a I'm Brian Gilliam, and I'm a retired professor uh, in the music department here at Duke. And uh, I've dedicated much of my scholarly life to studying the works of Strauss. And um, in doing so, I got to know the family very well. Both the, um, I'm really showing how old I am though. <laughs> Elise Strauss, the daughter-in-law, actually knew her. Um, my wife and I had vacation with her in Garmisch, and I had a chance as I was over my various books to talk to her. She um, happened to be at the bedside when Strauss was dying, and she wrote everything down. So if I say something that he said, um, it comes from a very uh, honest source. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the metamorphosis and these students here have just put everything into this. This is going to be a very special experience. It's a unique work, a special work, a dark, dark piece, but an important work nonetheless. So, Metamorphosen. Strauss' the Metamorphosen of 1945 was written at a time when the composer began revising uh, the forms, revisiting the forms and genres of his youth. Concertos, wind symphonies, sonatinas, chamber music of all sorts. And um, so one might interpret the Metamorphosen as being a part of this trend. Indeed, its original title, uh, which became its subtitle, was a study for 23 strings. But while these classically modeled works suggest a sense of hope in a dark period of Austro-Germanic culture, uh, this study morphed into something quite different. Um, what started out uh, after a commission by Paul Sacher and his Collegium Musicum of Zurich in August of 1944, what started out as a commission became a rare Straussian example of outwardly expressed inner anguish. And what I'd like to do now is offer you a background um, or context for Strauss's bleak state of mind at this time, when the usually optimistic, unflappable composer did constant psychological battle between resignation and hope. In Germany, uh, uh, post-World uh, War I economic collapse brought about dramatic gains for the right wing, particularly the National Socialists, whose membership had quadrupled since Hitler uh, returned to politics in 1925. After the Nazis' ultimate success in 1933, Strauss tried to create ties with the regime. He was appointed president of the uh, Reich Chamber of Music, and though his relationship with the regime was rough from the start, and he was fired 18 months later. On one level, one can have sympathy for this frightened 70-year-old composer who now feared for the future of his Jewish daughter-in-law and two half-Jewish grandsons. But Strauss accepted this position with his eyes wide open, and his brief and shameful moment in the political spotlight remains an indelible part of his legacy. But from 1935 onward, uh, we see a composer taking an inward turn, rereading German poets such as Goethe and Rückert, indeed sketching songs with such titles as Atonement and Inner Peace. The young, brash Strauss had composed tone poems such as A Hero's Life, or uh, his also Schlag Zaratustra, and they featured a powerful artist, artist 
artistic figure at odds with a passive society. For the older Strauss of the 1930s, that society had become a malevolent world of pseudo-heroism. Pseudo-heroism. Strauss, the optimist, saw the current Nazi regime as a force that may well feed on its own lies and deception, but it is ultimately unable to deceive the noble spirit, or so he thought. In the mid-1930s, Strauss believed in the power of the individual spirit over politics, and he saw the spirit made manifest in music and in nature. With this spirit, there was thus a potential for the individual to be transformed to the level of the, design, of the divine. And repeat that. With this spirit, there was a potential for the individual to be transformed to the level of the divine. But for the atheistic Strauss, that divine was to be found from within and not beyond. Transformation, transfiguration, and metamorphosis had been lifelong obsessions for Strauss, from death and transfiguration of 1890 and the metamorphosis of 1945. The more Strauss sought to strengthen this sense of inner sanctuary through work by composing in his secluded Garmisch home in the Bavarian Alps, the more difficult he found it to avert the outer world. His Jewish daughter-in-law was no longer entirely safe in his Garmisch home. Strauss appealed to a friend who had connection with Hermann Goering for help. Let me quote. He writes, we've gone through some bitter weeks beyond the unstable worries about the future of my two dear grandsons, which I have carried in my heart for years. The fate of my daughter-in-law has caused me great pain. Please help me, dear friend. There's little evidence that his friend or anyone else over the next few years would be able to do anything of substance for Strauss. It was not until his move to Vienna in 1941, under the protection of the Gauleiter of Vienna, that Strauss was able to attain any peace of mind. Throughout his life, Strauss spoke of liberation through work, and by work he meant the process of introspection that comes through artistic activity. The atheist Strauss believed that the divine is to be found from within during the act of creation, and that works of art, music being foremost, are reflections of this inner divinity. As we, as we shall see with the metamorphosum, Strauss himself would call this concept into question. After completing his last opera, Capriccio, of 1941, Strauss declared his compositional career to be over, and works composed thereafter he called wrist exercises. These are late works in the classical genres of his youth. These pieces, to which he refused to assign opus numbers, these pieces outwardly suggest a composer's faith in the German musical tradition. But there is an important element of inner despair suggested by the subtitle, say, to the 1943 Woodwind Sonatina, which he subtitled From the Studio of an Invalid. By now, Strauss found, composing, uh, found himself composing music catalyzed by the opposing forces of resignation and hope. But the bombing of Vienna had begun, and Strauss had to return to Garmisch. And there, he waited out the war, making ins musical ins arrangements of earlier pieces, writing out new copies of old tone poems for sale, generating income, and by intensive reading, especially Goethe. Yet outside his study, the situation only worsened. Allied bombing raids increased. Music, Munich was in flames, and his birthplace was destroyed. This brings us to the metamorphosis for 23 solo strings, which has been, until recently, characterized as a work mourning the destruction of Munich. Now, while that is true, 
it hardly suffices in describing a work of such profundity. And it certainly doesn't help us understand the meaning of the work's title. So, not since Death and Transfiguration had Strauss written music with such a sustained seriousness of purpose. But in the metamorphosis, there is no ecstatic sense of apotheosis as in Death and Transfiguration. With its cathartic movement from C minor to C major, I don't know if you know Death and Transfiguration, but the main point of it is we go from its dark C minor and the hero is lying in on his deathbed, but he, he sees the ideal, he sees his image of God in himself, and that's represented by C major. So, uh, that's not the case in the Metamorphosis. In the Metamorphosis, he retains C minor to the bitter end. You might call it death without transfiguration. <laughs> Sorry to say that. It was once described by Alan Jefferson as the saddest piece of music ever written. Um, and the Metamorphose is an atypical Straussian work, devoid of rhetorical posing of the tone poems and the stylization of the operas. Recent research shows that the Metamorphose is based on a poem by Goethe called No One Can Know Himself. Let me read, and I'm almost done. No one can know himself or detach himself from his innermost being. And every day he puts to the test whatever he can objectively consider, what he is and what he was, what he can do and what he may. For Goethe, metamorph metamorphosis meant an inner transformative growth through contemplation and creativity into the realm of the divine. As a scientist and an art theorist, Goethe's whole botany is a way of explaining the artistic or creative process. I'm quoting here. As I looked upon nature, so do I upon art, Goethe wrote while in Italy. And I am now achieving a more perfect conception of the highest things which men have made. One Goethe scholar observed, and I quote, metamorphosis evolves upward from an entirely primal, pre-literary state, upward beyond the natural striving of humanity, to an epiphany beyond oneself, to the inward realization of the glorification and transformation of humanity, unquote. Goethe may declare that we cannot fully know ourselves, but he observes that we are all compelled to try. Goethe in literature and Beethoven in music had always been a symbol of reinvigoration throughout modern German history. Thus, thus it was hardly surprising that in the ruins of World War I, Strauss and his librettist Hugo von Hofmannsthal reworked Beethoven's Ruins of Athens, adding a Goethe-like character um, a mysterious stranger who gazes upon the ruins of an Athenian market, seeing a divine spark. At this very moment, the stranger receives this creative Promethean spark and um, is transfigured as the reincarnation of, reincarnation of Prometheus himself. While the stranger speaks, Strauss writes some curious music as an accompaniment. Let me play for you what that is. I think you will recognize it, you're all smart people. I gotta unlock this. Here we go, you ready? Thank you. 
thinks they recognize that. Well, let me trigger your imagination here. This is what he modeled it on. Now the other, see what he was doing. It's a very, not very subtle allusion to Beethoven's fifth symphony. This is the coda theme of that final movement of the fifth symphony, by the way, which goes from C minor to C major. Um, and um, anyway, so that's that. In the ruins of Athens, he's able to become transfigured. Um, Strauss's con concept of transformation had always been a utopian one before this piece tonight. But for the composer in 1945, in the Metamorphosum, this process of inner knowledge was dystopian, revealing not the divine, but rather the bestial. In short, exposing humanity's dangerous potential toward the um, basis animal instincts. In uh, May 1945, when Germany surrendered, Strauss declared, from May 1st onwards, the most terrible period of human history came to an end. The 12 year reign of bestiality, ignorance, and anti-culture under the greatest criminals, during which Germany's 2,000 years of cultural evolution met its doom and irreplaceable monuments of architecture and works of art were destroyed by a criminal rabble of soldiers. So I could resist, I read the program note about the Joan Tower piece, and in fact, that was written in the wake of the, the World Trade Center collapsing. Well, I think now we can imagine what Strauss was going through when the Munich National Theater bombed, the Vienna Opera destroyed, uh, the Dresden Opera House destroyed, the Leipzig Gewandhaus bombed out. And again, he's, he's agnostic, he's an atheist, really. And uh, for him, those are like churches. The Opera House is a temple of culture, a temple of, of the highest spirituality. And those were destroyed. He saw himself as part of this legacy as well. Um, so, the metamorphosis is full of anguish, with little, if any, relief, uh, as if this piece were um, performed in one long exhale. I'm not going to go into the structure of the piece, it's, it's difficult even for specialists, but I would like to point out the two fundamental themes of the work, which seem to be in constant state of flux, or metamorphosis, if you wish. The first one is distinguished by its dotted gesture, this short, long gesture, a gesture reminiscent of Beethoven's um, um, funeral march from the heroic Third Symphony. You recognize that? You know, the funeral march. All right, so this is, he takes this theme and puts it into this context. theme I want to highlight is also derivative, but this time it comes from Wagner, more specifically from Tristan und Isolde, where King Mark laments the noble Tristan's betrayal. He has stolen his wife, Isolde, and he says to Tristan, this Tristan, 
to me, like A2 Tristan, you to me, where has loyalty fled now that Tristan has betrayed me? So here is the, uh, see what I've done here. This is the metamorphosis. The moment of ultimate transformation in the coda of this work is a chillingly deformed rendition of the funeral march theme from Beethoven to Leuven, a painful signifier for a German culture gone wrong, a culture brought down by its darkest instincts. The culture that gave us Beethoven gave us Buchenwald. The culture that gave us Goethe also gave us Goebbels. Keep in mind. So here is um, So in, in closing, so personal was this work that the reserved Strauss could not bear to conduct the premiere, though he asked if he could conduct the dress rehearsal, which he did without interruption or comment. At the end, he simply thanked the musicians and left the hall. By rejecting the option of physical exile during the 12-year ride, Strauss led a double life of sorts. On the one hand, the jovial, self-assured public persona, and on the other, the troubled private artist with a utopian notion of inner peace, battling re resignation and disgust. And, as is made clear by the metamorphosis, by losing that battle by the end of the war. Yet soon thereafter, while in actual exile in Switzerland, Strauss would ultimately find serenity he would regain that notion of inner peace through creative work. The result would be his four last songs, that many of you know, I'm sure. Agnostic to the end, Strauss, with dignity and without any self-pity, affirmed that he was not afraid to die, that he had lived a full life. On his deathbed in September 1940, Nine, he maintained, I have my Pflicht getan. Es gibt nichts mehr. I have done my job. There is nothing more for me to do. 
These may, may well have been his last words. Even without the knowledge of approaching death, he neither needed nor wanted redemption, continuing to hold to his lifelong belief that the divine is to be found here on earth, in art, in ideas, in the act of creation. Thank you very much.